Today is the 12th of August, and that is the International Youth Day. And that is why we're gathered here. We're gathered here to celebrate today, to celebrate with young people. But as we all know, in Nigeria today there are a lot of issues affecting us as a people, us as a country. And we need to talk about these issues and find a way forward. And that is why we're here. So we have some very fine people who will be on the panel today and will be talking to us about these matters. So please, if you don't mind again, let's look at this front seat. So once again, welcome everyone. My name is David. Strong is the soul and wise and beautiful. The seed of godlike powers are in us still. Gods are we, bad saints, heroes, if we but will. With that, I'm going to call Mr. Bailey's of Good Sound Entertainment to lead us in the national anthem. Bailey's. Now let's encourage him. Okay? Now, now. We're too cold. We need some coffee, right? Good morning, morning everybody. Can we all right as a national anthem? We all know the national anthem. Let's go on the count of three. Three, two, one. Arise, so come back, Freak out, farmer. But I'm like, shit, I got cheese though. 
You know, <laughs> shit, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm saying that you have to realize that there's no stigma in farming. This farm was starting in Guara that I'm telling you about, it's, it's kicked off. We have investors from all over the world. And we decided to make it a farm resort. So it's going to have hotels, conference centers. It's going to have um, an African village. It's going to have um, um, polo fields. It's going to have golf courses. It's going to have entertainment complex. It's going to have everything. You don't need to go to Dubai anymore. You can come to Guara, you get everything, top level. Investors are falling over each other to come and invest in our property. And that's what you want. We're a bunch of Nigerian guys that did not some foreigners, not some South Africans, some people that went to school, it's called GSS Kuru. Where the hell is that? Okay? But from GSS Kuru came an idea. And I must confess, and I thank all those that taught me over the years. We had incredible teachers. I know what you guys have now. They gave us confidence. They said, Mr. Kalamu is still around now. I don't know. He, I mean, they gave us confidence. They made us feel that they used to, every time we got a right result, they would bring, they would shoot it on the wall and shoot um, King's College Lagos and we always beat King's College Lagos. And that was their pride. So they set a standard. Since King's College was the top school, we beat them every time until when I graduated. I don't know now. But I'm saying that you guys have so much potential. Don't stigmatize any profession. Open your mind. Even if you study nursing or architecture or engineering, be ready to do anything. And let me tell you guys one thing. There are two critical things for the next century, all your life, all over the world, is farming and water. Those are the most two critical things in the world. Better think of a way to be involved in those two things, especially farming. Farming is, if you cannot feed yourself, you cannot survive. You cannot depend on China for chicken. You have to grow your own chicken. And we don't have enough. We don't have enough eggs in Nigeria. Let me tell you guys. If you bring a million eggs today, the human thing in Abuja can absorb it. They will buy it. They don't have enough. So they, we don't have enough of anything. We are seeing important things. There's an, this government has done a great job in stopping rice um, importation. You guys will not know this, but Kebi State is the biggest supplier of rice in West Africa. And they have household women that have never seen the four walls of a classroom. They are making 10 million naira on their 10 hectares of rice farming a season. And now the rice is all season. It's not just your regular one season rice. They are farming all year. I heard a household lady talking on BBC. Her husband died, and the last when he died, he did 60 bags. And the guy was interviewed, how many bags do you do this year? 600 bags. How much is it a bag? 15,000 a bag. You do the math. Yeah, an illiterate household woman. They asked her, what did you do with it? Touch your bonsai neighbor. What do you do with this one? Touch I'll just farm more rice next year. She's not buying a Ferrari. I mean, Ferrari is freaking nice, I tell you that, though. But um, she's, she's, if you invest in her children, her children are going to be educated. So I think you young people have this opportunity to realize that there is so much. And I'll end on this last note. Go use that internet to find scholarships, to find grants. There are grants everywhere. I never paid a penny to go to school. I was, after Bongola State gave me a scholarship, the, the first, after my first semester, the school gave me a full scholarship with a, with a B average, that's nothing, hey, especially American education. That means you read two chapters and do an exam. I mean, come on, I just did my A-levels. I read three freaking books to do an exam well, once a year. So there's scholarships out there, especially Canada. Because America, Trump kind of messed up America for a second. Canada is giving scholarships. You guys look for, look for grants. I'm not saying move to Canada. There are grants. Grants are different from scholarships. Grants is dash. They are dashing you money. If you have an idea, they will dash you money. You can talk to somebody like Silas about that. They, they, are, they are dealing with international organizations that will give you grants if you have just, just from an idea. And that's why I think for Nigerians, it's difficult for us to understand. Because you, know, you, don't want to, you don't understand how somebody could give you money for an idea. Just an idea, not a product, an idea. So you guys just remember, you guys are the, you are the biggest proponents, biggest future for ideas. Remember those young American boys in their mother's garages? They changed the world. They changed the world with ideas. The mainframe computer was as big as this floor. 
and Bill Gates told IBM that I can make it into a lap, into a desktop. They told him that he was, his, his, his weed was too strong. And in less than 10 years, they turned it into this computer that was this building into a desktop, not into a laptop, not into this. This is as strong as that main frame that they had in 1972 in IBM. So you guys, the future is in your hands. But just believe. The fact that you're here today means that you believe. But I'm telling you, keep believing. But make sure you carry with confidence. For lack of better word, words that you guys understand, let the swagger be much. But carry that swagger with ideas in your head, not just Gucci on your neck. Carry it with an idea and sell ideas. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that one. Thank you so, so much for being here to reach out to us. We're grateful for that. Okay, right. We'll just go next to a command performance. We have a lot of activities lined up. We have um, T-shirts to give out to you know, people in the audience who participate actively. And while he was speaking, a piece of paper went wrong. Please don't hesitate to take down something, write down a question. There will be a session where we'll have to interact with our panelists. Thank you. Thank you once again. So I'm going to call on Mark Priest Judah. He will be giving us a poetry performance. A round of applause for Mark Priest. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I'm um, um, hyped. So I'm so um, I'm tensed right now. Thank you for that, sir. Thank you so much. Africa is a very spiritual continent. Probably not even the creator of the black continent could tell you otherwise, because it is a gigantic atmosphere of beautiful black witches and wizards. Totally into animals to come and disturb the sound sleep of their fellow black folks in the night. Senorita is in people that are no longer fearful on the internet no more. If you're too short, there is a stool that you can stand on, come on, and take a look. You would see that the Europeans are softly providing the alcohol that gets the black slave drunk whenever he's on tour, front and back inside and out. Back to back, the best way to hide the lies in between two truths, right? Clap your hands as if you were from the Hallelujah the Choir, because the one who told you Mongo Park first found the water is the liar. But they don't write down things like this in our history books. Tell us the truth. No, I will tell you what. We pay school fees to learn how not to be black. White curriculum, white Christmas, white weddings. Even black Michael Jackson metamorphosing into a white man. Just <laughs> bunch of third worlds hypnotized by the United States to kill Mama the Gaddafi. The smell of the dead body isn't coming from anywhere for the mother dear, it's from the armpit of the neighboring West African country. The white man is as large a threat to us as we are an enormous threat to ourselves, cause divide us and you will rule us. Use the variousness of traps against the black people. You are poisoned. Do not know the medicine is poison. Everything is subtle, psychological, and indirect. You know, Boko Haram took and are still taking the lives of Nigerians. And Some times back, we heard that they sent a letter threatening to invade South Africa if they do not stop killing Nigerians. But the news didn't tell us that only Boko Haram has the right to kill Nigerians. 
Solomon came to the Queen Sheba, which means there was Ethiopia before the Europeans knew about the Ivory Coast. Why are we always talking about the white man's coming and not how long we've been here? Why is it always least appreciated when it's made in here than when it's made in China? Maybe it's just how to siphon hard currencies away into private accounts of blood through oil deals. Inflated contracts and overpricing of imported goods. How can a land producing good food and product most of its consumed food? Nobody is telling us what Plateau states think contributed to the London Bridge. People that are narcissists, so they detest those who ain't themselves. Probably that is why the Nigerian doesn't love the black man. The Negro knew what other races come to Africa to look for. The Negro sells the better part of his land to a foreign man. The Negro doesn't give the job to the credible, but to his relative. The Negro nationalizes and plays sport for the foreign land. The Negro imports everything that it could provide for itself. A Negro stole money and said a porcupine, a snake, a rat, a monkey swallowed it. Blue stories from black people. It's just another black man pushing the blame on black people. Put your colonial shades and your painted faces on Facebook pages aside so we can tell ourselves how black in the outside and in the inside we look like. Maybe the powers of darkness have become suspicious of the blessings of the initial black civilization. Hey. You want the government to protect you from that which you have been manipulated to fear. The idea is not to educate but to indoctrinate. Why do you think bleaching products make their fortunes on black soil? The beautiful black ladies and gentlemen are now having plantain complexions all of a sudden. Artificial inferiority complex chips implanted in our ears and eyes conditioning the Afro masses that black is Luciferian and white is Jesus Christ. Probably that is why a law in the United States do not look alike. If it's a lie, we are all lying people of God. This is reality TV. So we ain't keeping up with the quotations. <laughs> Okay. Wow, speechless. It's totally speechless. That's that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, that priest. Awesome mind right there. The ability to weave words and twist ideas like you do. Great work. Okay, we'll move on straight ahead without taking any more time to the panelist discussion. This is why we're here. This is how we've come. We're going to hear from our panelists. There are microphones on the table, and um, I hope they're switched on. If they're not, little button just underneath it. If you want to speak, you push it, and you speak into the microphone. So we'll go straight to the panelist discussion. And um, welcome again, everybody. Please feel free to, if something hits you and you like it, you're excited, express yourself. Okay, we're here to celebrate and we're here to interact. And I believe we're gonna have a, we're already having an awesome time. So we'll go right straight into it. There are a number of questions, but we would like to start with Mr. Away. Yes, sir, he's a farmer. Before he was a, he went into full-time farming, he was a government worker. And he will be talking to us based on some of the questions that myself and young people in the audience will be asking. So, I will keep, let's... All right, Mr. So we have a couple of questions here, but number one on my list is, how does the present farmer header conflict across Nigeria impact food production and the hunger crisis? And what can be done to correct this? 
Okay, because right now we're facing a hunger crisis in Nigeria. Not many people are talking about it. Not many people are even aware that it, it is there. But every day there is, in, there is rising food prices. A lot of people can't even fend for them, can't even have a meal a day. And it's worsening. It seems like there's no end in sight. So I'm going to take that question again so you, then you can jump straight into it. How does the present farmer hinder conflict across Nigeria impact food production and the hunger crisis? And what can be done to correct this impasse? Please, Mr. Awei. My name is Awei Moro uh, a young farmer, just like the architect said. Architect, you, you just inspired me while you were giving your speech. I'm impressed that there are minds that are really thinking this way. Um, the headers farmers conflict in Nigeria really started a while from now. It's not something that really started new. Besides, I want to believe that from creation, if you look at the Bible account of Cain and Abel, there has always been a conflict be between farmers and headers because. Uh, Abel had to, uh, Cain had to kill Abel. Being a crop farmer, or an animal rearer, uh, and Abel a crop farmer. So this has been there for a while. But it is actually on an increase in Nigeria for two basic reasons. One, I believe increase in population. Two, climate change. Uh, before today, the, the crisis or the conflict have been very minimal. Very minimal in the sense that there, there were enough resources, the ground for everybody. Uh, people that were tilling the land for food production were not as much as, as we have today. And looking at the increase in population, the resources being the land is becoming very scarce because the farmers are on the increase, thereby cultivating those lands that were actually used for grazing. And this has caused a very serious conflict between these two group agriculturists. Of course, their aim, I believe, and their goal is one, food security and production in Nigeria or globally. But well, you found out that this, the, the society today is increasing in number, thereby reducing the quant uh, quantity of the resources. Now, having said this, you you will also you will believe that once the resources are getting scarce, there will surely be room for conflict. But this can be managed. This can seriously be managed. In our own case. I believe government policies and uh, the setup of the authority hierarchy actually did not do the job as I went to. Because in Nigeria, our authorities mostly uh, they, they react to things instead of being proactive. When things start, they don't always act on it. They always wait on, until it degenerates before they start looking for solutions. And one of the reasons this has broken down seriously, I believe, is the, the failure in the rural chiefs to be able to curtail and solve these conflicts from the grassroots. In those days, the chiefs Local chiefs were given the power, you know, to, to sit down and mediate between warring factions. But we found out that today, tribalism has taken place. We no longer live as one. If you check my name, my, my name is Awei Umoru Ige. The Umoru in it is a Fulani name. Believe me, there were Fulani settlers in my village, and they have lived there for over 100 years. I grew up as a young man and met them in our farm. They were paying nothing. They were living there, grazing there. What we benefit from them is the cow dog. 
They graze our land, they give us the dung, and we farm. I, I grew up, my father will always take us to the farm, and we meet these people there. So, this was the way people were living before today. But we find out that today there is conflict. Why? If I may ask, why? Alright, sorry, I'm going to cut you with it a little bit. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have so much time, so you may need to keep the go straight to the major point. We're all going to have maybe four, four minutes each of our question. Alright. So, now, food crisis. Of course, there is going to be food crisis everywhere. If what is happening today continues, we read in, in, in social media, we see on TV how headers have been going around cutting farmlands. I can assure you, the last two weeks in Basa local government was have been very very terrible, very terrible. I lost my farm just last week. I planted maize, I planted potatoes. But the whole of it was cut down. A whole lot of one hectare of potato and uh, maize. Now, how can that not bring food shortage? Because today, instead of me and my family enjoying it from what we have found and also selling it to make profit and make money from it, we'll have to go looking for resources on how to live our lives in the next one year. And this has happened to so many families, all due to what government not being proactive. Okay, so what can be done in the sectors of food? Yeah, I, I think in, in 2019, government brought out a plan, what we call uh, today the, the ranches. But that, ran, that plan has not come to, to be to the, till date because of politics. One, politics. To lack of proper funding and manpower. Federal government have not been able to develop that plan. But I believe that the way forward is actually to start ranches. Okay. Um, the way forward is actually to start ranches. Yes. Yeah. Alright, so we'll go straight to the next question. We'll come back to you, Mr. Right now we we'll talk to Manan Sam. And the question is just uh, as of July 2020. Nigeria has about 3.4 million displaced population. The Nigerian security situation has worsened over the years. It has reached a point today that people are afraid to go to their farms and we are presently facing a hunger crisis, just as Mr. Way has uh, impressed upon us. So, how did we get here as a people where we are at this you know, terrible situation? Okay, uh, thank you very much. My name is Salis Mohammed Abdul Salam, uh, founder of Displaced Women and Children Foundation, CEO Face of Peace, and uh, National Convener Movement for the Rights of Our Majority Child. Four minutes for such very sensitive issue yeah. is small, but um, considering the fact that we will have uh, the opportunity to answer questions, we will be able to highlight more on uh, what you want to hear, not what we want to tell you. you know, this is supposed to be an interactive session, so what you want to hear is different from what we want to tell you. you know? So. Now, he's asking how we got here. Our priorities changed. In certain forums, I say to people, uh, I was the last Muslim to own a nightclub in Joss, and some of my uh, Muslim faithfuls who pinch me. So it is not too nice a thing to say. But, if you have that kind of a background. At 24, I was a nightclub proprietor, and today I'm a peace builder. It means you can actually achieve anything. It's nothing impossible to achieve. We got here today because our priorities changed. Number one, this rural urban migration thinking. 
everybody wants to live in the big city. Number two, we go to school today to get certificates, not to get educated. I left the University 86. I have never used my certificate anywhere. In fact, maybe I need to even go and ask my mom where the certificate is. Knowledge today has been relegated to the background and then it is certificates that we want to brandish. And the not here where we have this crisis. Education has suffered. Education is suffering. We have today living and alive over six million and Marjorie children. I can assure you, I think I said it to uh, Suleiman, when he was talking about JTA, I was having goosebumps when they talk about uh, Justin Ambassadors because we never knew all these things. We never knew them. Look at the desert one here. At least we have over 40 years acquaintanceship. Now, coming back to the issue, who would want to convince me that you have less than 50%? I know we have over 50% of the bandits, insurgents, kidnappers in Nigeria are products of the Almajiri practice. So, we keep trying to address issues. The farmer said that we're being reactive, not proactive. This year alone, that same Almajiri practice will send forth into the youth platform maybe another two or three million uneducated people without passion, people without people who never knew love, people without education, people without skill, people without knowledge beyond tradition. So if we have to address this issue related to how farming and food productivity will improve. These are some of the places we must address because if we keep producing those kinds of people, they will end up being bandits, end up being insurgents. 99% of those who actually started Boko Haram practice are disciples. What do you refer to these disciples? And Nazarene? So, if we don't address these fundamentals, we will continue to produce. Are you not worried with the numbers where bandits are concerned? There are thousands. People will always go back and blame the government. For some of us who have done humanitarian work in the Northeast, Today, as I speak with you, in Dambua IDP camp and Bio IDP camp, my organization still run literacy classes for about uh, 300 and, uh, I mean, 3,272 children. These children, some of them have not used the toothbrush in three years. Well, we had to teach them how to brush. What do you think is going to happen in 10 years time if this set of children are like that? So, how did we get here? We got here because we ignored these practices in the society. And this is the product. Bandits, insurgents, kidnappers, uh, terrorists I'm sorry to say they are all youths now 
the good ones on the other side, like uh, my co-panelist is here, a farmer. The farmers too are youths. So the choice is yours. Which divide do you want to stand with? Okay. Alright. Thank you very much. So uh, that all you said just raises more questions. So we need to now find a way. Where do we ship the book? And if that's not the case, who is responsible? For bringing back sanity, how do we correct all these? But this is these questions are not for you to respond immediately. It's just so the people in the audience can think over it and help them frame their questions. We'll go straight to the next panelist, and we'll come back to you, Mr. Salas, in a bit. Uh, Anita George, you're welcome, Mom. All right. So uh, the question goes like this: Art influences society by changing opinions, instilling values, and translating experiences across space and time, and are often described to be the repository of society's collective memory. How, in your opinion, can art and cultural values impact positively on the present state of insecurity and our mutual strive for economic betterment? Bearing in mind what Mr. Salis responded, saying that we have uh, misplaced our priorities, things weren't always like this, but has comment. Now, what can be done? How, you being in the creative industry for so long, how can this help us retract our steps? Simply, going back to our old way, old customs that were taught to us by our parents, this customs tradition, art still included, inclusive with it, where were created to improve our social economic growth in the communities. We go back to this customs, old way of worship. Our parents most probably they were craftsmen, fishermen, good cooks. They handed um, they handed over their skills to their children, who eventually did to the next generation. But nowadays, um, all these things I looked about, like uh, Mr. Um, Architect Sule said, a lot of the youth these days don't think that that is priority. They've been disregarded because they have no idea where they come from. They have no ideas of their traditional way of life. They have no idea about their culture because of Christianity, because of trying to belong. And Christian. it's... I don't want to emphasize too much on religion. Oh. You understand? It's already a very, very sensitive issue, especially amongst the youth. A lot of you, I don't think, um, let's just leave it as that, but it has a lot to do with colonialism and they brought in different foreign cultures to us. And so we lost, um, we, our value systems became disregarded and looked at as unchristian and stopped. So things like, simple things like weaving cloths, dyeing, which was very, very common in Canada. He was, um, Alatri Salis was talking about the Almagiris. In those days, Kano, the men were the ones that have been to their dying homes. It's the men that do the dying. You understand? If there's going to be a particular ceremony coming of age, feeding, farming, or anything, it's the men that die and the, and the materials have a peculiar design for it. But now all those things have been pushed under the carpet. Everybody wants to wear jeans, trousers, hoodies, and a lot of other things. I'm wearing a jean. Yeah, that's fair enough, you know, but um, to a certain extent, like I'm wearing something that's averted by a house and guy, you will never believe it. So as much as possible, even if every day we get up and dress up, we should always try to promote this. Most of these artists that are still in the village, they don't have access to come to town. And uh, Mr. Stanley's mentioned about the fact that a lot of people from the rural areas are already moving to the cities. Now, this is because most of these traditions, like dying, wood carving, sculpture, that our mothers and fathers taught us, have not been supported by maybe policies that should have been created to support these things. Everybody's moving out of the villages to come to the cities to look for things that they think would be of better interest. But if you go to places like Oshogo, certain places in Kano, certain places down south. A lot of, you find lots of people still carving 
and still um, sculpturing, still doing cloth dyeing, and they were taught by their parents, but um, it's, it's not encouraging because everybody wants to come, you understand what I'm trying to say. And meanwhile, all these little arts and crafts are the things that generate tax revenue, they generate finance, job opportunities for the community, the rural communities. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, insight. So, now, it looks like we have, a, we have an idea. Uh, you, your response impacts directly also on the answer that Mr. Salis gave yeah. earlier. So, we have an idea of what we should be doing, but we're not doing it. Well, why? And that also is for us to keep thinking. So, I'll go straight to pay more. You're welcome. So uh, my question will be, I think I'll have to give you this mic. You have a mic with you? So my question to you will be, educational and mentorship programs have been recognized to play a huge role in the reduction of lawlessness in many countries. That is education and mentorship programs. So in what ways can our country, that is Nigeria, apply these programs considering the widespread Criminality. As an education, now as an edu uh, educator yourself, and uh, what do you think? How can mentorship programs help in reduction of criminality across the country? Okay, thank you. So happy Youth Day once again. Uh, education, I think, and I tell people that as a person, I grew up in the rural area. I didn't grow up in just, I grew up in a small village, I call it a small village called Gindri. And uh, yes, that's subject to argument as to whether Gindri is a village or, or a city, but I still call it a village. Okay, but I think the first thing that education did to me and to all of us who grew there is to give us a doorway and to say that life isn't going to be here. You know, there's, there's a gateway out of the small things we come from into the world and when i hear people talk about education as an educator as a school owner as a parent the things that i think about the children first is that we need to give children the foundation a foundation that makes life possible completely so for me what's the What's the foundation? One, being able to read properly, being able to express yourself through writing, you know, or, or through speaking or whatever, and being able and having the curiosity to research. Okay, I, I hear us tell people, oh, colonialism, and that's why when I hear us doing the whole Africa pride thing, I, I laugh a little because I think that the world has gone really global. It's good to love your culture, it's good to appreciate it, but be aware that you're part of a bigger society and that the world is going to get more and more homogeneous and not more and more unique as the time goes by. So if you're importing, if you're bringing in, if you're exporting your culture to these people, what are you going to say? And as a storyteller, that's what I would want to see. I feel that the Chinua Achebes of life and all that were able to make the successes they had because they could tell the African story to a global perspective, to a global person. And here, that is what we're supposed to do. What is the story we're carrying and how do we carry it out into the globe? So I feel that that is what your education should be. Your education is not left in the hands of your teachers. Basically, the only thing any of us can give anybody right now is the foundation. What you do with your foundation is going to be up to you. If you know how to use the internet, how are you going to use it? If you're on Instagram, how are you going to use Instagram to become a global personality? Because people are doing it and they don't have two heads. Okay, that's me sounding like a mother. So you know what we tell our children? If you don't come first, we tell you you don't have a head. The one that came first did not have two heads, okay? So none of us has two heads. But you see, for every Western culture out there, all it's looking for is for you to bring in your African personality, your unique outlook in life, and find yourself out there. Let's all lie to ourselves. A lot of things are not going to change about Africa. 
Unfortunately, let's tell ourselves the truth. A lot of things are not going to change. You're not going to find out why COVID is not hitting us. Because you don't have the research institutions and all of that. But you can leverage on what has been done from elsewhere and what you have here. And I think the power of leverage is what education should give you. So what are the answers to the questions? I don't know them. But you have to be able to ask yourself. That's what education should do for you. It should strike curiosity. Curiosity that says, okay, what am I doing? What is happening in the world right now? What is happening to me? And how do I uh, marry it? And then finally for mentorship, which is where I should stop. Sorry I, if I've gone past my four, four, uh, four minutes. Okay. I think what mentorship does is to tell you that others have done it. Okay? okay? It's not to make you a disciple in the strictest sense of the word. Okay, it's to be able to say that others have done it. What principles can you take from where they have been and make it yours? And I do think that what's happening to criminality and all these other things is because people don't know there's an option. Okay, I was hit by criminality. My car was stolen. Me and my daughter had just come out of my car and it was stolen. And that was like two, three months ago. Okay, and honestly, if I had met the thief, I don't even have it in me to get angry with them. Why? Because this is the option they know, you know? So mentorship is important because we need to let people know that there are options. There are things, there are ways, you know, and, and all of that. And when people don't feel like they have an option, then they, are, they sentence themselves to criminality. Okay, so there are options. Now, that also gives us more questions. Like, what are these options? Why are we not making use of it? Are they readily available? All these we'll have to find out somehow. But uh, Mr. Victor Prince Dixon just came in. Uh, he's also a member of the panel, but uh, he was held up somewhere. So you're welcome, sir. Because if you take a chair, just close to it. All oh, right. Is the inventor of the common sense, common sense card game? All right. So we'll go straight to Kenneth. All right, Mr. Kenneth. This is it. According to the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, and under employment, under employment among youth between 15 and 34 years rose to 57%. How can technological innovations be used to create an enabling environment for young people to earn a living? Um, good everyone, my name is Awun Kenneth and I'm a digital marketer, just a bit of introduction. So I've worked on projects that have been sponsored by Bella Ninja and USAID. And why I'm giving this bit of history is, it has sort of like opened my eye as a digital marketer, because I then work on diverse like projects on different ranges, right? And when it comes to unemployment, you first have to like take a step back from that question and look at like the problem, right? Um, from a different perspective. So when you mention unemployment, um, let's say for youths, employers are also complaining about um, their, there's a lack of quality skill, um, labor. So for example, if you have a conversation with someone who just recently graduated and they are like, how much can you earn you know, as a new graduate or where can you get a job at? Some response would be like, oh, there's no job, right? Someone else will be like, oh, there's a job, but they can't get that job. They don't see themselves doing that. But if you ask, have you been able to like search? You know, do you know what Jobberman is? Um, do you know what Indeed.com is? Have you heard of Angellist.co? You know, all these websites. Have you heard of um, WeWorkRemotely.com? You don't see a lot of a lot of people saying they know of these websites, right? Where you can get like a remote job and not work, you know, for a Nigerian company, right? So it leads back to the conversation about um, education and lack of awareness and organizations like, let's say, Google have a program called Google Digital Skills where I've trained over 2,000 people on, right? And this tra training takes me from places to places. Um, last year, I did over 4,000 people with MTM at their MTM employability um, training. And you hear graduates, like I'm not a graduate, right? But I've been teaching these courses to people who are graduates and they don't have awareness on this. Like wow. where, where to go next? So a good example is if you take a short course 
on Coursera or Udemy or you go to a let's say foreign school, right? Part of the package they sell to you is as you become a student here, while you're also going, the faculty is responsible to prepare you for the job market and also send your applications to prospective employers, right? So a good example would let's say the MIT. MIT engineering faculty has companies like Tesla, you know, the major um, car manufacturing companies, and we partnership with them. So when they have students graduating, they also reach out to these companies on behalf of these students. How many Nigerian universities are doing that? You don't see um, that, right? How many Nigerian universities have a course whereby um, towards the end of your final year, they tell you that, oh, this is how you write a CV. This is how you proper, uh, let's say, proper um, craft a story for your cover letter, right? Your cover letter isn't meant for you to, you know, rehase or re, um, repeat what you've said in your, in your CV, right? So, the idea or the argument on unemployment, the idea is unemployment, right? But have we exhausted um, the available, let's say, opportunities that we have? So, for just a last example would be India, right? So, India found a way of crafting out a market whereby um, there wasn't enough job, but it could provide jobs to, they could provide services to other people in different countries. So, I know when you run Google Ads, and anytime I have to call, let's say, Google customer care for Google ads, right? I expect to hear someone British or American, but what I receive most of the time is someone Indian, right? And this person is not in UK or, you know, California, they're somewhere in Bangladesh, right? And just basically providing customer service as a business. So how many of us are looking at those opportunities? Yeah. Okay, huge question. Thank you so much. I'll also... Let's take some time to ask Mr. Victor Presidente to also throw some highlights on that question. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sister, I'm very, very sorry for coming uh, this late. I love what uh, you know, Kenneth just said. I think was it last week that he posted a job. Anybody who knows Kenneth knows that for a while now, Kenneth has been begging people. Literally begging people to learn digital skills. But at the point in time, one of his major posts is, do you know anybody that wants to learn digital? But I will teach for free. This for a couple of years now. That's to tell you how it is. I'll start by saying this. In principle, I do not believe in there is no job. Not possible. Okay. Yes. You can sell all the pity game, the victimization game you want to sell. But there are jobs, believe you me. As he stands there, he will tell you, because of the global expansion, every market, every business wants to go global now. So you're looking for distributors, you're looking for marketers, you're looking for people who are going to help expand the reach of the product. So if there's any time in the world that people need hands now, it's actually present in this age. Because even organizations are going from a large and you know, corporation to a lean corporation, so that you see people like maybe Forta Way, for instance. We realize that at the end of the day, that even almost start something staff. Yeah. Because something staff is already hitting the you know, unicorn. So it tells you that we are not dealing with that one where we are dealing with a thousand staff anymore. We are dealing with you. Deal with a small number, outsource other things that come in. We are in the world of outsourcing. So you don't need an office, you don't need a place. But I'm like, in fact, most times some people, this is their business. They don't need any office, they do this. But unfortunately, you hear argument like one of the challenges in Nigeria is not enough light. And my argument at every point in time has been. With a little principle of a scripture, to whom, man, if, you, if you manage a little, more will be given. I know after seeing light to the level of eight hours per day. So the question is, what have we done with eight hours light? Then we can start quarreling over 24 hours light. But for now, we have not. We can't make that argument. Yet to see here consistently the issue of no light. My position is this. I've done some little of growth in my journey. Started in the media, invented common sense had my challenges with common sense, moved, and then in the process of my challenge with common sense and other things I was doing, I got to realize that one of the major challenges was that we don't have capacity to do what we want to do. And anybody who is in the field, who knows, sometimes you choose a dream or a thing you want to push forward, and yet you don't have people to carry it. I'll give you a practical example. At the point I wanted to print common sense, I invented common sense, I did a park game, which is a park. 
with all the noise we were doing in Joss, there was only one place in the whole of Joss that completed a park that has that got it. And that was this place. Uh, where is this place in Jones? That's just close now. That's having issues. One pretty press. Um, I've forgotten the name. That was the only place in the whole of Joss that can print a park rapid. At the point in time I went there, only to realize that the only machine that can print a park by cut and wrap was spoiled. Because the only person that can manage and service it comes from Germany. But the last time he came, he was not treated well, so he has gone back. So the machine is there. No one can print. I'm back. In the whole of Joss, all the noise we were making about printing, I left us. I went to Abuja. At the point I got to Abuja, only two, three press, like the Yalia press and the rest, could do the job. But Yalia, based on the capacity, can only do 10 million copies for them to break even in terms of profit. I didn't have the money. I moved to Lagos. Again to Lagos, at the end of the day, nobody could print anything. The same, there was a size I needed to print before I could print common sense, and then it could break even for me and those that are printing. So the only option we had was for me to send to China. And that's the one I'm serious to send to China. Just oh. to print the cartoon. Do you understand? So I'll end by saying this. The challenge with us is we have bought, as young people, one of the major problems is that we bought the victimization story. We believe we want people to pity us. We want people to feel sorry for us. So it's easy to blame everyone except ourselves. It's easy to say the school is a problem, the parents is a problem, the government is a problem. No, sir, go check. The world has gone, that's right, what the what, what um, the school was trying to say. The world has gone so global that everybody can be empowered by just this simple thing. So the day you start blaming school, the system, from empowering you, there will be a problem. And then you need to understand how to solve problems. For you to solve problems, there are three things you must know. Okay. Is a problem basic? Is it complex? Is it wicked? Okay. If you are dealing with a basic problem, you have to have very basic education. If you are dealing with a complex problem, you need a complex education to solve a complex problem. If you are dealing with a wicked problem, you need a wicked education to solve it. Alright, now, that is a discussion for another. <laughs> what kind of problems are you facing? Now we solve them. I'm going to take one last question before we move into uh, the performance, another performance, and I'll throw this question to architects. I'm still yet to get over your keynote address, but <laughs> I know, let's do this. Um, Beyond having a skill and an economically viable ability, maybe talent, what factors are there that can prevent young people from contributing to self and communal development? And what are the things that are in our society that prevents young minds, vibrant, energetic people, from contributing meaningfully to themselves and their community? You know what? I'll throw that question to you. Serial Awesome. <laughs> okay, use mine. All right. Thank you. Hello, I'm actually Mark Adewa, and I would want to start with We're here to talk about the youth, youth empowerment, and most times I always tell people the youth actually need to have, they need to actually be ready for the change, and the change needs to come with the belief, the value, and the attitude. Awesome. You know, so it's a personal thing. We have what we call the self-reflection. I don't know if anybody wakes up in the morning amongst all of you and reflects before you start your day. Because that, to me, you should have a journal. Everybody needs to have a journal. And if you don't have a journal, to me, you're just starting. So by the time you wake up in the morning, if you can actually start up with your reflection, write up your schedule for the day, I think it's a step ahead. Because if we don't fix our personal attitude, we can't face the world. That's the truth. No matter what we tell you today, if you don't fix your attitude, you can't face the world. That is just the awesome truth. So, there's a lot about the youth empowerment. That's the honest truth. You know, I'm a youth, so I, I don't like it when I find a lot of youth not actually, or will I say, saying they don't have a job, they're complaining about the government. For me, I started working when I was in SS2. I like the hustle spirit. Doesn't mean my parents don't have enough to give me. They give me a lot, yes, but I want to have my own money from that class, you know. For my JS1, I try to be an Indian. You know? It's just a spirit, not, not for anything. 
You mustn't do it, but it's a spirit for me, and it helped me today. Before I graduated, I was a network administrator. I certified CCNA. At that time, I certified 2006. Nobody at that time, I think most people were really certified. I started working, I was working and I enjoyed it, and today I know where I am. If I was in the state, I think I should be very far, but I want to be here. So, yeah. No, no, I want to be here. I want to be here. There's a lot here. There's a lot of opportunities in Nigeria. That's what I'm Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's the truth. So, youth, I really want to give you guys the courage to actually know there's a lot to take out of the box. There's a lot. I enjoyed what you said about digital marketing. It's actually a good one. Actually, Digital marketing is actually one of its skills. It's something I want to hit on. How many of you really have skills in anything? Even in packing sand, what skill do you have? Because the future will come where a lot of jobs will not count. What will put you out there is your skill. That's the honest truth. In whatever it is, you need to actually know what you're good at and bring it out. You know? It's very important. So I think you guys should look into that and deep into that. I think that's it. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our comments. Are we having fun here? Are we inspired? Are we motivated? Are we pushed to go and take over the world? Because that's what we're here about Young Man Africa. It doesn't, it's not gender. It's a young, a young Man Africa stands for ever vibrant ideas, energetic people, irrespective of male or female. Okay? Um, I can refer to Architect Sullivan as Young Man Africa, not because of his age and because of the ideas in his head. Or the, 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 the mind, the spirit he has, you know, to achieve. And that's what we're here to do, and that's what we are celebrating today. Uh, my name is Kumar Musa Kanzaki. According to architects, Sully, Canada gets to pay for someone's idea. Now, if I have idea, how will Canada get to know about the idea? And how will I get paid for the idea? Thank you. You can go get grants for the idea. The grant is free money, like I said. You just have to have an idea. Let's say you want to develop um, a tracking system for cows. As you can tell, I like cows a lot. You want to develop a tracking system for cows. Okay? You can go to just Google tracking system for cows grants. You're going to get 20,000 hits. And it's a gamble. You're going to keep searching for these people till you find some ranch in Australia that says they want to train ranchers. There's a young guy from just here that was, um, was a caddy on the golf course. And one um, uh, a German gentleman took him to Germany to help him work on his farm. And when he went, he saw that the guy had great connection skills. I'm talking cow language here. Yeah. He has great connection skills with cows. Because cows actually connect to human beings. You can love you. When I go, when I go to the ranch, the cows freaking run towards me. Because I love cows. I've always loved cows as a child. I used to ride cows as a child. So you have to, so this guy connected to this guy's cows and he wouldn't let him come back. And the boy said his father said he has to come back to Jaws. And the boy left crying. The little girl in the house was crying because that was just an opportunity. So you have to search and this digital marketing thing is talking about is so critical there's so much money out there dude ford foundation the gates foundation have over 500 million dollars if you're a woman in the world you have no reason to pay to go to school they are giving women scholarships everywhere especially black women but i can't tell you that go to this website but if you Google it and get away from Instagram, the time you spend on Instagram and Facebook, you can find a grant, you can find a scholarship. I've taken so much, so many kids to my school, to my alma mater, Howard University. I'm not doing it anymore. They're too, you guys are too savvy for me to be calling my team and calling my school. Go to the internet, use me as a reference. They will call me. Americans will call you, they will call me. Just put my name and my number there, they will call me. You know, so but you have to do it yourself. You have to search. There's money out there. This is what we put. So that's why you guys are saying some people, some morons were saying Bill Gates wants to give us injection and, and kill us. 
oh, really smart. The guy wants to kill you, his audience, his market that buy his product. He wants to kill his mind. That made a lot of sense. These guys are giving, Bill Gates has convinced 600 billionaires, billionaires, USD billionaires, not Naira, not hush puppy. USD billionaires. Okay. Not. He has convinced, not Abakara and his clown, USD billionaires has convinced 600 of them to give away 90% of their income. 90%. That means someone like Bill Gates that's worth 100 billion is going to give 90 billion away in his lifetime. He's only going to leave only, only, going to leave 10 billion dollars, only to his family and his kids. Only 10 billion dollars. Okay, so feel sorry for those kids, okay? These guys are as altruistic as you can get. And these guys don't go to no damn church or no goddamn mosque, like Fela says. They go to humanity. These guys, the, the vaccine, the vaccine for malaria is about to be shown. It's about to showcase. And who gave the last $150 million for it? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I'm saying that there is so much out there, there's so much money. The Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, Steve Jobs, Apple Foundation, Google is giving you. I mean, there's a test that Google used to give. If you pass that test from anywhere in the world, you'll give you employment to Google. You'll be, in, you'll be in California working for Google. So there's opportunities out there's money out there. I don't want to talk about local ones, but local ones have so much politics involved in them. Okay? But there is money out there. You just have to click, go to Google and search for it. And you'll get it. Let me, let me, let me add to your question. Um, everybody has some form of idea. Now, it is not enough. Everybody in this world has some form of idea. It's not enough. Your idea has to be unique. And then, you must have 99.9% .9 conviction. And what that means is, you must hone it what I mean by whom, you must develop the idea to a level that you can breathe life into it and it will move. You understand? Uh, growing up, we used to have ideas, but they were basically fantasies. You know, like you see in cartoon. They, have, they were fantasies, they were not ideas that are usable. Just last year, for instance, you know, I'm sure, look at this here. Uh, now, for your head, computer finish. See, I'm sitting down here. I see if you know there here. See, I'm there. You know, DG of IT. Now, what I'm saying here is, when we had a discussion just last year in J-Town Ambassadors, when we had an idea, a youth like you in my office who said, uh, Music, you know, plus football equals peace. And then people were like, let's reframe this thing, you know. Okay, let it be music, you know, and football uh, will give us peace. Something like that. But a youth like you, his name is Luca Elayo. Is this still a youth? This turned turn 40 anyway. So he, he said, no, we should write it music and put plus there, you know, and then plus music equals peace. If you, we had 17 international media organizations reporting an event that took place in Just Not, only Just Not, and ended up in the stadium. 17 international media. Yahoo is the sixth biggest media organization in the world. This thing I'm telling you was on Yahoo as a news. It didn't make any sense. But when you look at how it happened, what is music plus football equals peace? That is where you know, we had to hone the idea. What I mean by hone, I, I know they say hone like Yoruba or hone. Yeah. 
is H O N E. That is, we had to complete the idea. We had to develop it and make it workable. You know? And the catch there was not the name, it was the content of the idea. What was the content of the idea? Taking supposed enemies in the same locations where people don't see eye to eye and form football teams that you know comprises different tribes and different religions as a must and kept them to train together from people who were fighting we had to build team spirit and then we took these people to play these matches where Okay. They are scared of entering. So you must develop your idea and make it workable before you can call it an idea. So at that stage, it becomes a concept. Okay. And that concept now, you can now get a concept note. Then you come back to what he's saying. You now look for people who will provide for you grants when it is a concept that is workable. All right. I'm so sorry I interrupted you when you were talking. But uh, we just have to keep it one minute response. And so, so Tosin uh, is going to respond quickly, then Kenneth will respond quickly, then we go to Supreme's performance. Okay, okay. My, my, I think that's my field, and I can confidently tell you this. You see, this thing is a growth, it's a value chain. You have an idea, you develop an idea to a concept, you commit, uh, move a concept to a format. Now, format is where you start dealing with what you call intellectual property. And when you go to intellectual property, at that point you start selling things based on. Take for instance now, people sell films based on on demand. Meaning, gone are the days when you just walk in to buy a CD. All just because you put a film on Netflix, somebody watch, pay to watch. And even Netflix, for somebody to pay to watch, for those who know how it works very well, at the back end, you have one video with two different formats. One can be 8K, one can be 4K quality. Different prices. You shoot a production and you want to show it only in Nigeria, the price is different. Imagine it moves to Africa and become an extra and terrestrial rights. Imagine it moves to a global and become a global right. At the point I want to sell common sense presently, one of the things I'm working behind the scenes is that I'm moving common sense to about 125 languages. The same common sense. I'm selling to different languages. And at the point I sell, I'm giving rights, distribution rights at different levels. Nigerian right, African right, sub-regional right, West African right. That is where the power is. So the concept might come, but you need to understand the technicality that goes behind the scene. And my advice would be, go and study intellectual property. It is not a... You can design. Most Nigerians can be creative, but they don't know how to move from creativity to the business of creativity. There's a business of creativity. Creativity, everybody will clap for you and salute you. But for you to really enter where the money highway is, is actually the business of creativity. Right. And what makes it happen is intellectual Property. Okay. Study it, it will solve this problem. Thank you, Kenneth. Okay, um, so nice question. I, I'm actually waiting for us to get back into agriculture because I'm well prepared for that discussion, <laughs> right? Because I'm team of the program. So I think stories are important, right? And it's not just enough to say um, it's out there, go and look for it. You also have to give people, when you're training or advising people, like practical solutions at the end of the day. So when you are talking, um, currently the idea is a program running. It's called Water for Energy, right? So you can go to we as W E for F West Africa org, right? Or just go to this, the main website is we for for F, and basically you can apply um, if you have an idea or how you can basically create sustainability innovations around water, energy, and food. And you have the what do you call it now? Let me just I'm going to the website right now. So you stand a chance if your idea is accepted to receive over one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, right? And this is currently going specifically for West Africa. How much is that again? One hundred and eighty thousand dollars. So that is a lot of money when you convert it to naira. Like, <laughs> trust me, it's huge, right? Forty eight thousand dollars is over forty million naira. So just do the calculation. So we can work together on that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you all so very much. Supreme, you're ready for us. Is the music ready? Then we're here. All right, and for those on the panel table, I don't know if you can see what Supreme will be doing. You may need to see it this way. Okay.
Young Man Africa. Welcome everyone. Well, not right now, we're going to go straight into the second round of questions and we'll make it even more snappy than the first one. So, Mr. Awe, are you ready for us? Okay, so we'll just go straight into the second round of questions. Two million people in Nigeria are faced with worsening levels of food insecurity crisis. The figure is expected to rise to over 12.8 million. As already established, this is due to you know, farmers displaced from their ancestral lands and increasing demand for food. What is this, the implication of these statistics for agropreneurs? That is, we've had the young people still going to farming from the keynote address, you know, not enough eggs even. And, but yet, we have this worsening levels of food insecurity, we have this crisis. What is the implication of all this with regards to encouraging young people to take up agricultural pursuits? Thank you again for yet another opportunity. Um, I will just make it a, a one-word answer. Okay. I think the implication there is opportunity. Opportunity for young youths, entrepreneurs who are coming up. Uh, the conflict between the headers farmers in Nigeria is creating a room for youth to see opportunity in it. Because whenever there is a problem, a challenge, just like so many people here have uh, outlined, challenges are bound to happen, the challenges are bound to come. But what do you do with your challenges? Of course, these figures will easily rend fear in the minds of people telling us uh, there's going to be food shortages, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be dead, and what have you. But I can assure you, for young youths sitting here this morning, this should represent opportunities. Because the problems are there. These problems are almost getting beyond our government, so to say. But youths can decide within themselves to use this as stepping stones to opportunity. As I'm sitting here, I can assure you that I am looking at opportunities in this crisis where we can bounce back because we can create forums just like uh, one of the panelists said, a young man sat in his office and gave them a concept or an idea. And what is the idea? Music plus football equals to peace. Now when you go to these conflict regions, you go to these conflict uh, places, you will see that there are opportunities that abound. One, to make an impact in the life of those that have been run down. You can go out of your way as a young man. You make opportunities, you create money out of it. Because this certainly is going to bring hunger. What do you do with it? As youthful as you are, you use your mind, you cash into the ideas Kenneth is talking about here. I'm sure we have right in the internet, right on our phones, grants, agricultural grants. CBM has one. But if government one comes with uh, politics, you, you can run over that. You check and there are agricultural grants where we can turn this to an advantage. Because going forward, youth should not fold their hands and begin to cry and weep that because our farmlands have been burned down, our crops have been burned down, we are going to die in hunger. Say school. So, sir, we can turn this to opportunity. Right. Thank you very much for that. One. I will go quickly to Mr. Sanders. All right, and this question is not so different from the prior one. Considering the present state of kidnappings and banditry, what, in your opinion, is the way out of the situation? The first question was, how did we get here? And now, what is the way out of it? Okay, um, I think we, we, we have a basic uh, 
challenge now, uh, which is of lamentation, like Prince just said, you know, we keep lamenting, lamenting. Um, are we really ready as a people? Are the youths ready to solve this problem? Because there is a difference knowing a problem or the existence of a problem and then the willingness to solve the problem. Agreed. Uh, at my age, yes, uh, we can apologize to the youths for certain failures, you know. Uh, my son is 27, so definitely uh, I don't fit the answers. I don't pass answers. It's only my son that can do that. So now I could apologize on behalf of my my friends and colleagues, for instance, in, in JTA and say we have failed in certain ways because truth be told, or not, there is cross parental failure today in Nigeria. Okay. Cross parental failure. You know? And then they, we are experiencing heights of spiritual failure in Nigeria today. Yes. Anybody who tells you otherwise is lying. You know? And this today has made us breed a society without conscience. Society without conscience. Yes. You know? So, conspiracy of silence. It tells you it explains one of the reasons why we say society without conscience. Conspiracy of silence. You hide your own criminal. Or support, or support your own criminal. You know? So, and then, it, it, it's, it's eroding. You know, this morals keeps eroding every blessed day. So, we keep finding excuses. We blame government. We blame this. We blame that. We blame, 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 blame. How prepared are we to solve the problem? If we continue to have these kinds of discussions, today in this hall, how many youths are prepared to do anything, volunteer for just six months? How many of you? Volunteer. Pompa, your own you you don't nearly leave you don't come and talk. You 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 have part of our orientation. You're prepared. That is why I can call your call you by your name. I can call this by his name because these are examples of people that are before he was able to get any uh, harvest, you went through some you you how prepared are we? That is the question. We Displaced Women and Children Foundation, for instance, was registered in 2006. But the very first funding we got from Nexus through Prince Charles Dixon was in 2017. But everybody knew Face of Peace, everybody knew this place, and we never had any foreign funding. What we did was we sacrifice by implementing our own ideas and people decided to now follow us. He has come to Crest Hotel and taken contestants for free. But today everywhere I see him, I respect him just because of that spirit of voluntarism. Our youths of today do not have it. And I keep telling my son, he plays the guitar very well. I say, you won't bring any CD in this house. Me, I will not go and give any DJ or CD to play in an event. You must learn to play music. I want to hear notes. I want to hear keys. You should be, I want to hear harmony. You should be able to speak to me in music. Not go and bring beat from one day I'm a student and then create the beat. Then you just come and tell me, yeah, like the video. Yeah. Lakbaja does the music. The video does the singing. For those who know, they should know. 
Okay. So are we prepared to solve the problem? The problem is solvable. They are solvable. Thank you for that uh, hope. Thank you for that you know, shot of love. <laughs> so we'll go straight to editor, Judge. Okay. This is it. Nigeria has a huge population of young people, and many of many of these people of the younger generation, it's at five and below. In what is popularly referred to as uh, there's always called a generational gap between the older generation and the younger generation. We've experienced young people venting out on the Twitter bar. Like, these old people don't understand that I earn my source of livelihood from this thing, and you've totally cut me off. And let's imagine that there are million people who earn their livelihood from that and they've been cut off. So, so it, it seems like there's a, there's a breach of, in communication between uh, they say the younger people are the digital natives, while the older people are the digital migrants. Uh, they were born into this thing, so we know it. So, I don't know, does this gap, does this generational gap account for some of the challenges that young people in Nigeria are facing towards in nation building and even advancing themselves? What do you think? Yes, it does. First of all, when it comes to technology, in those days, 20, when we talk about generational gap, I give that gap of 20 years because if you are born today, in another 20 years you become an adult to be able to take for yourself legally. Now, the um, technology has greatly improved, so a lot of our youth, they have information at their fingertips. Then we need to take into consideration in what I said earlier and what Sally's by has just mentioned our um, values. There are some cultural values or cultures that our elders have have that we have not properly imbibed, so it's causing a backlog of a lot of things. Like, let me give an example: self-discipline. Mr. Mark had mentioned it, Sally's mentioned it, even architect Sule, and every other person here has mentioned it in one form or the other. Now, self-discipline, let me go back to that traditional old value system that existed. We are too much in a hurry. We provide, everybody wants to behave like the white person. That artist, the poetic um, speaker, Sprint, he, you see, he's, he, he, he spoke about poetry, yeah? really awesome, very educated. Now, that is a problem. Some of us don't even really know what how many languages we have in our communities. Some of us here don't even really know how to say the national item. Simple values that will help discipline yourself, then be able to appreciate certain values you will change, like circumcision, almagibis, because they're not helping, and girl child, lack of education or girl child. But there are certain values I think that that generation that should try and imbibe. So it's all about coming together to understand. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Coming together to understand. Okay. But uh, there was something, there was a comment that um, during this, uh, was it, um, um, what you call that wire that young people got over and away? I can't really remember. Answers. Yeah, answers. There was a comment that um, um, the president made about Nigerian youths being very lazy. That's evidence of generational gap. He's not really very aware what the plight of these children are. It's all well and good to say education, we don't have access to education, it's expensive, I can't be educated. Um, but our priorities are different, our priorities have changed. Our priorities have changed. If you're supposed to be at the office at 8 o'clock, which means that by 10 minutes to 8 you should be at the office. If you are given a job to do, you should go an extra mile. If they say sweep this place, you should not only sweep the place, you should dust and do the cobwebs. We go an extra mile. It's all about personal values. And that's why we say we are becoming, a lot of us are parents and grandparents now. What have we taught the kids? A lot of the kids are growing up on the streets because everybody's looking for money, so the parents are not even at all to keep an eye. You know, so if we think about that, those are issues that 
Thank you much, much. So pay more. I know you're ready for us. All right. Um, this is going to be connected to a little to what Mr. Salis answered. Looking at our national pursuits towards the total development of the Nigerian youth, which human rights do you think are currently susceptible to threats? For instance, we've had young people say uh, it's our right to speak out, it's our right to to gather, it's our right to this and that, and the present administration is not really taking us seriously. So as an educator, which human rights do you think are susceptible to threats and how does that impact on our development as a people? Okay, so human rights, I'm not a lawyer. Okay, but I think if I think um, we're born with certain human freedoms and maybe the most uh, whatever and profound is the freedom to exist. You know, for me, I think I would say that the human rights that is endangered now and the one that I wish young people could have is the right to dream and to pursue life that is better than the one you have. Right to dream. Yes, and pursue a better life than the one that we have. You know, so this is what I think. I think that it's, um, I was reluctant to accept this because I really felt like for a youth day, the youth should speak to each other. You know, I, I know how it feels to, to be born here and to see that your mates and other clients in there that are teenagers are multi billionaires And we think that nothing happens here. We think that because we've been born here, we've been sentenced to being at the bottom of the ladder of humanity. But if there's anything that I would like us to have as a right to the young people, is the right to aspire. The right to know that life as it is now does not have to be life. The life that you settle for. So how do you find this better life? First, you need to believe that it's there. You know, I've heard the question, the guy that asked, how, I, how do I get the opportunities in Canada? And I think what I hear him say is how am I going to break out of this place? How does oh. anyone get to know a me who lives in just? How do I get a place on the global stage? And, and for me, well, this is probably my last question. So this is what I wish we would see, every young person. I think this is the best generation ever okay. that anybody has been born into. Anybody. I don't see technology as something that should hamper you. Like, like we said, your technology natives. Like he said, instead of looking and seeing that there's going to be a food crisis, he's looking and seeing that there's going to be food opportunity. Uh, they tell you that in Chinese, the, the characters that represent opportunity are the same ones that represent danger. Oh. You know, so if you could look at life right now, and see the opportunity, you will stop being afraid of what is out there. There's so many people, there are over 7 billion people. There's somebody right now in Asia who needs what you have. And he's not going to exploit you. There's somebody right now in the US who is looking for somebody with your unique experiences and your life. So the right that is endangered and the right that I wish we would awaken it's not about our government. It's not about the circumstances we were born into. It's the internal prison we've put ourselves in. And if we could take ourselves out, if we could stand out and tell ourselves that there's a life out there, we're going to find it. We're going to find it, we're going to follow, and we're going to enjoy it. So first, the right to aspire. And let the right to aspire come because you open the prison in your heart. Awesome. Well done. Yeah. Okay, I really like that because for young man Africa, that's our slogan. In the way you innovate, inform, and aspire. All right, thank you really much for that. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Kenneth, all right, you were really keen on the agriculture thing. So this is for you. What can the government do to encourage and help young people be gainfully employed? using technological innovations. 
Now, that applies also to agriculture, not just the tech or the digital world. How can we relate or connect this to agricultural development? Okay. Um, one became an agriculturist, title of the program, right? Um, so like I said earlier, I think we should be mindful about stories and how we tell stories and also how we read stories, right? So I think a lot of youth right now are, let's say, interested in tech because of the media has kind of like taken it as a bandwagon for it, really. Um, anywhere you go, you hear people advertising, talking about programming and opportunities therein. For a while, I wanted to become a programmer because I knew of people earning $5,000 a month here in Jaws. And if you convert that, that's around two million there, right? Um, but recently, I read a story about a project manager that's also earning the same amount, right? A project manager doesn't know, you know, JavaScript, doesn't know Python, right? So how come someone that just organizes people, documents, ends that high, right? So a lot of people don't even know that the opportunities are out there and you can access them. So bringing it down to agriculture, there's this lady called um, Indidi Okonkwo. She runs Sahel Consulting, right? And it's a very, very, um, well, I say one of the most important consulting, um, private-based consulting firms in Nigeria. And she specializes in agriculture. They run a fund for Master, uh, Master, uh, MasterCard in conjunction with the Nigerian government, helping Nigerian farmers. Um, with loans, right? So instead of something called Nourish in Africa, so anybody here right now can go online, search for Nourish in Africa, and if you're accepted, Sorry, say that again. Nourish in Africa. Nourish in Africa, and if you're accepted, they would, um, you know, induct into their fund of you know training you or your business to revenue base of like a million dollars, right? That's the goal of them, because they believe that by 2030, um, the agri business is bound to reach a trillion dollars. So, and I think again, when we have arguments or discussions, we run away from putting numbers or facts into them to sort of like but, um, buttress our points. So, for example, the average NI in Nigeria spends about 56% of their income on food. Like, I don't need to tell anyone that, like, you know it already. If you earn 100k, most 50k is going on food, right? Um, but in America right now, like, 8% of your income goes to food. So she tells you that there is an opportunity there, right? And once you're thinking about like money or getting access to capital, there is money in Nigeria, right? I did the correction of my question. I said, point of correction, there's money in Ikoyu, Lagos. But that's just a joke. Um, so in 2019, startups in Nigeria raised over $400 million. Recently, startups in Nigeria, right? So these are brought them. But most of the startups are based in Lagos, if we are being honest about it, right? But it doesn't portray the point that um, startups in Nigeria, like Nigerian found, founded startups, raised over $400 million. So are we accessing those stories? Are we reading them? A very good example that always annoys me when I think about the story is Tomato Joss. So someone came from Harvard Business School, you know, left. Um, the fantastic environment of Boston, Massachusetts, America, came down to Nigeria, worked for the NGO, saw an opportunity in the agri space, right, in Tomato, precisely, and did her research for a year, and found out that Kaduna, between Kaduna, Kaduna, Kaduna and Nasara, they have a very good land for Tomato, like the land and climate fits it good, because she did the whole research, like whole sample soil test within Nigeria, she went far. This same lady used Nigerian banks to raise over 5 billion naira to set up her. Nigerian banks? Yes. Five billion. And Nigerian investors to set up her, um, her, her manufacturing plants, right? So, how many of us are aware of that story? This is not in Nigeria, by the way, right? So, there are stories out there, and if I want to bring something down to like what you, as let's say, a young person, can do with your mobile phone. A lady was serving here in Jos, was posted here to serve, right, in NYC Copa. She saw strawberries for the first time and was like, wow, it's so cheap here, right? And took a picture, posted it on Twitter, when it was not banned. <laughs> posted it on Twitter, it got a lot of engagement. People retweeted it, people in the league saw it. And they were like, oh, can you help us get this, right? 
And next day, she founded the Grocery Lady on Instagram. And now she has over 17,000 followers. And most of the pictures on that account, you can attest that these are cauliflowers, things that you get here in Joss. But she's distributing and selling it over to people in different states in Nigeria, right? And just from Instagram, there is no rent she's paying that I know of. Thank you for that wonderful contribution. Okay? Uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Alright, let me go to the architect, Suleiman. And the question will also apply to the Suleiman. Now, there's this. With regards to this rising state of food insecurity, what do you think we as Nigerians, the government, can do to forestall this decline and increase food productivity. Can I just mention that the early hunger case, most likely over 50% of that area is going to be. That means there is not enough. And there are rural areas where people live on less than a plate of food a day. So what can we do as a people to halt this food insecurity and actually to if 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 a million eggs isn't even enough for charity, how about those people who are in the hinterland who don't even have access? So what can we do to halt this decline and increase productivity? Okay, let me take that. Um, it's going to be more than a minute, by the way, because that's a, okay, just that's a short question. question. I'll try and make it as quick as possible. Um, I mentioned to you guys that we started. PPP project with the federal government where we took over a $1 billion asset. And uh, we're basically bringing uh, in um, agri developers into uh, the Kurara Dam area. But other than that, we're also bringing other investors. We're trying to make it like a farming resort, like I said. And the kicker in the farming resort, apart from all the resort stuff, the hotels, the golf courses, the entertainment centers and everything is that we convinced the presidency to put a Camp David style resort on this property and we're getting an additional we have 8,000 hectares right now we're getting an additional 15,000 hectares from Kaduna State so that's going to make us over four times the size of Abuja right now so we're developing a new town but the, the, the essence of the town is agriculture and like I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to say that word again. I don't know how to pronounce stigmatization. It's kind of tongue-tied. We have to take out the stigma away from being a farmer. And for me, it's easy because I grew up, like I said, fifth generation farmers. So we've always been proud to say we're farmers. Even though we have doctors, lawyers, engineers, almost every woman will tell you first, because we're proud of it, we're farmers. Right? We own cows, we own farms. You know, we're one of the biggest cocoa, sibling producers in the country, so in Mandela. So we like the farming thing, but the average kid doesn't like the word farmer. There's a, there's a, there's a zero type. Zero type, I don't stigma. I don't know what, but I don't know what it is. Farmers got money. They make a lot of money. One hectare of corn will give you one million. One hectare of corn. So if you have 10 hectares, 10 million. So it's a lot of money in farming. So what the federal government is doing, is that they are using us as a, we told them to use us as a, as a pilot program and as the first risk, okay? So we're going to convert the, the asset into an, an employment opportunity for over 10,000 people. And we guarantee them that the, the guy that just packs up the hay, that's the grass that you feed cows, all he does, that guy you see on the highway just picking up grass, it's going to make it 100,000 naira a month, guaranteed. And it's going to come with a motorbike and a small house to stay. So once you do something like that, we have so many graduates that want to do fancy jobs, especially middle class people. And middle class people always want to go work in a government office. The, what has happened to your generation is that the government jobs are not there anymore. In my generation, everybody wanted to work for the government. Those of us that didn't work for the government, even some of our parents were like, are you okay? How are you going to write a check to yourself? How are you going to survive? But, you know, we did it. You know what I'm saying, right? So what's going to happen with this food insecurity, I'll make it brief, is that Gurara being the pilot program, 
Our next stop after Gurara is going to be Kachimbila, which is 10 times bigger than Gurara. So if Gurara can provide 10,000 em uh, people employed with a lowest salary of 100,000, that means that Kachimbila can give 100,000 people employed. 36 states and federal capital, 37, divided by 235. That's how many dams we have. But we don't have water, we don't have light, we don't have irrigation. We have problem with farming. So now what we're doing in Gurari, we're telling the federal government that you can actually make money from these things. Just give it to me. You cannot give, government doesn't do business. Even in America, government doesn't do business. Government provides security, we provide infrastructure, and then businesses do business. It's the same everywhere. So what needs to happen is that once you let the average NYC guy knows that he can move to Mandela. And let me tell you guys something. <laughs> I've been almost everywhere in this world. There is no place in the face of this planet like Mandela Plateau. It is awesome. it. This year, this year, let me tell you how uh, just is cold. Mandela is much colder. It snowed in Mandela, not hail. It snowed in Mandela. And it can get warm in Mandela. Mandela has everything. Mambila has the most beautiful scenery. And that's where the Gashi, uh, Gashaka Gunti Park is. Gashaka Gunti is one of the biggest game reserves in the world. Nobody has promoted it. It's as big as any in Kenya. So I'm saying that the opportunities for this food security thing is just a matter of now. I mean, this government has produced at least 200,000 jobs for, for, for the young people, for farming. And they, they have a program with Nisal. That's the... Um, uh, central bank, microfinancing. But how many kids are really to take that risk? How many kids want to tell their girlfriends they are farmers? How many kids that studied law want to go tell their families that I'm going to farm in Mambila? So this, the, the stigmatization of the entire nation has to change. Okay, you know, so that's... One house, I know it's getting really... Hey, please just uh, okay. two, two seconds, sorry. Okay. You know, most of you know Apti, right? It will shock you to know that Every week, I say, quote me, every week, they slaughter 4,000 broilers. Every week. Every week? Yes. Empty. As a university, as an institution, 4,000 broilers every week. I have told my son, no, the younger one this time around, not the guitar player, <laughs> stay, stay in this your mama's uh, poultry. And get master's degree inside. <laughs> okay, is there employment opportunity? <laughs> yeah, when they consume one one institution, they slaughter four thousand broilers, birds, chickens every week. Four thousand. Okay. One institution. You tell me there are no opportunities, but we take eggs from here to make green. From here. You see, this is why it will look as if we are quite arrogant when we tell you, let nobody talk about that there are no opportunities in Nigeria. It's not that we don't feel that people go through pains, you understand. But we know the truth. The truth of the matter, look, statistics is good, I agree. But I always ask, what is the organic motive behind the statistics? Numbers can come, but there are numbers that are designed to intimidate you. Yeah. For instance, don't tell me about all the poor things about Nigeria. What are the statistics about how many innovators you have in Nigeria? How many times do you see? So I don't, I don't treat for numbers, is it? Because numbers have motives. There are numbers I can give you and I confuse you and make you feel paralyzed. And yet there are numbers you can get that will also enable and inspire you to achieve further. And so for me, as much as I appreciate research, any research that does not inspire, I have issues with it. It has to be balanced. Tell me the good things happening in Nigeria. Don't tell me only the evil things happening in Nigeria. One of the reasons why most of us seem to be more educated about the evils in Nigeria is that media keep pumping, pumping, evil, 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 <laughs> evil. And then you think they are very intelligent. They are not intelligent. It's deliberate. It's just to mess up the head so that you don't see the opportunity that comes in it. Like you said, true. Between 2019 2020, Nigeria spent $22.7 on food. 227 trillion eating. But you won't understand the implication of that numbers, except you understand how numbers work. Anytime you compare developing countries and developed countries, you will see that developing countries spend more on food. 
advanced countries spend more on science development, capacity development. So that is where the challenge is. So while there is a food opportunity, I am more concerned. Let's understand how this thing works. Last year, I opened a company together with a friend, Synergy Agro Ally, and we enter into farming. You see, while we talk about the challenges, okay, let me go backtrack a little bit. Between 2019, yes, 2018, 2019, the stock market made on the average of almost, I think, um, 300 and something trillion. Out of that 300 and something trillion that were made, 78% were repatriated back outside Nigeria. Why? Because most of those who had that money are non Nigerians investing in the system. So there is this funny thing happening in Nigeria that I don't find it comfortable. You tell us everything bad about us, invest, take the money, move out of the system, and yet we are still the bad guy. No. That's the first thing. That's why I agree with Prima when we started from the beginning. The first thing an average Nigerian must do deliver yourself from yourself first. Okay. We can give, hold on a little bit, we can give every, every solution here in point, but everybody knows that development is a system. You don't just take one thing and think everything will work. It is it's a value chain that goes from one step to another. When you talk agriculture, agriculture has moved beyond farming. Now we're talking smart farming. Now we're talking precision farming. That's what people are talking about. So it's not about how large the land is. It's how well do you understand what do I do to this land and this land will multiply. Go to, um, what was the name of this big shop? What by South Africa? Shop right. If you see the tomatoes they sell there and how much they sell it, you won't believe. But most of them come from here. And what pains me most time, you know who takes it there? Israelites. From Nigeria. Now, we have potatoes. Who takes it out? We went to buy, um, what do you call it? Wanted to buy and um, invest in, what's the name? Ginger in Kafanchan. It was in getting to Kavachan that we got to learn that in the whole world, Nigeria has a unique ginger that is better than anywhere in the world. Why? Because it's something the Kavanchan people do to their ginger that is just so unique. What do they do? They will harvest ginger. After harvesting it, they will bury it again for one year. Then it is after that one year before they harvest it out. That ginger is the most expensive ginger in the whole world. And what did I learn in the process? A very painful experience. What's a painful experience? Is this. Some guys came to buy ginger and they told them the highest producers of ginger was Kano. So they took them to Kano and they stayed in Kano. So anytime they asked for sample, Kano would leave and come to Kapata, pack sample, go back. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to tell you that this is not just a matter of agriculture, creativity, no. First, free yourself enough to know how to play in the field. Let's be honest. I'm going to go very practical and call names here. Go to Feringada. Feringada controls the influx of, um, what do you call it now, vegetables. But excuse me, sir, it's not the plants, the people, the farmers that make the money. When you go to Feringada, you bring your vegetable, you drop. The guy there in Feringada will tell you, go. And then come back so so day. They will decide how much is sold and how much they pay you. So to a large extent, we're not dealing with farming here again, we're dealing with managing the value chain. That's to tell you, the middleman, how powerful it is. Go to Yandoya. Yankaji. Go to Yandoya. They are not the guys doing the farming of Goya. But they control the value chain. Go to Yankaji. It's not the guys handling the broiler and the rest. They are the ones controlling the value chain. So, sir, it's not about working that in game. It's about you can be smart, look good, and play the game. But you must first of all free yourself from that vintage mentality. We, we are just too comfortable telling tests by moonlight. All right, you need to make me cry, but uh, okay. After that, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. After that, I just want to add up a little to this. Yeah, we're actually setting up a glow tech foundation, and the whole essence of the foundation is to enable this value chain. We're actually looking at the local governments to how make the locals remain in the local environment because a lot of things that bring the locals to the city is because you enjoy lights you enjoy clubs you enjoy so many things here so why don't you take that little to them so we're actually giving them power we're giving them mini grids funded by foreign partners grants with us you know not to really make money but to help out as a give back to the society, you know. 
So we want to help them with that to help with the agricultural system there, irrigation system too. Basically, our target is actually the irrigation system. Help them with that. And help them break the middleman connection so that they can actually make that money they need to make. Because the middleman actually make the money. That's the honest truth when it comes to agriculture. So we really want to break that chain for the locals. Yeah, we hope that works. Okay. Let me make one final comment. Um, I'll ask you guys a question again. I used to teach also. How many cows do you think are killed in Lagos every day? Are slaughtered for meat? How many cows? Lagos is the highest. How many do you think? How many? How many? It is 6,000 cows a day. Number two is, is Kano with 4,000 cows. So I've not given you a market of 10,000 cows. If I tell you guys here too, I can tell you where to go get the cows. Go do the research. A cow that is bought in, let's say, in the middle of the country, let's say from Nasrao for 150,000, that same cow is sold in Lagos for 450,000 during the regular season for 600 to 800,000 at Christmas. So, I'm not going to tell you guys how to do this. You're smarter than me. <laughs> Believe me, you're smarter than me. Find a way to sell 10 cows in Lagos that you buy for 150 and sell for 400. I'm sure you can do it. But how many of you are willing to be headsmen? You call us full and headsmen. We're proud of it. How many of you are willing to be headsmen? You have to be a headsman or a headswoman because you have to follow those cows to Lagos. You're going to put the cows in a truck and you're going to take a flight if you want or do whatever. You go do the deal by yourself so there's no middle. One. You go sell the cows in Lagos, put your money in your pocket, take a flight and come back and do it again and keep doing it over and over until you get to the point where you don't have to do anything. You can sit in an office in Kafanchan and that business will run itself. So the opportunities, all I have to do is tell you the, I told you about the eggs. How many of you thought, my daughter started poultry? We don't have enough chickens eggs or meat in Nigeria. So those are opportunities you young people have to just explore. We have already been doing our stuff, which is, I just hang out in jobs and I get an alert. I mean, that's, that's a reality. Okay, well, oh, now there's a lot. Okay. So it is, um, I'm happy everybody on the panel has something to say about this, but my own beat is, Every single person here can start farming. Use a paint bucket. When you grab your tomatoes, get the seeds and plant. Look after them. It saves you 500 naira a week on tomatoes. You can start with pepper. You can start with snails. I started doing snails and I found some. They've been chopping some of my plants. I found these snails. I started keeping them within the tire and they're getting bigger. You start something in house. Um, Mr. Dixon talked about this victimization attitude we have. Oh, feel sorry for me. Once anybody scratches your head, it means I need X, Y help. Mentorship does not mean you're going to be hanging out with me, Sally's architect, to give you money or better clothes to wear. It's about your values. What is more important? Is it the way you dress? Is it how you eat? Do you want to get free money? We're so used to getting everything free. Everything is that Nobody wants to work. Seriously, let me tell you, I'm a middle belter. We are about the laziest human beings in Nigeria. Okay. Below the belt. <laughs> I'm serious. Let's call it spade a spade. It's, it's, I cry to talk about it, but we are so lazy. Now look at me. We are over 10 people here. There are only two people who have asked questions. You don't have anything to offer. Okay. You don't have to, I don't understand. I guess we're going to the address right now. Please do our best. So I guess we'll have this. So straight into the questions now. <laughs> Dive straight into questions. If you have a question, there's a minimum number of questions you can take. But if you have a question, please indicate so I know. Before the question, question, please. Okay, Mr. I just okay. have a little thing to add to uh, our, our audience. Uh, everything I've been saying here this morning, but one thing everybody sitting here, this, every youth sitting here this afternoon should know is that we he, we're here talking about capital. 
what is really capital? What do we really refer to as capital? Capital is the knowledge of what you want to do and time. That's all you need to invest in whatever you want to achieve in life. Create the time and have knowledge. Develop yourself in whatever capacity, whatever you choose to do. In fact, I attended a seminar and the person training us says, if, if it is granite, you know how to sell. Learn how to package granite. In less than no time, you become a millionaire. Believe that and you can achieve it. All right, thank you. We'll go straight into the questions and we'll make it... Uh, okay, sorry, before we do the questions, the beautiful lady here at this, uh, she needs to run quickly. So we we'll want her to do a book donation to a community library that is starting in Bantam. I believe I'm correct, Pomfa? All right, so she started already. Okay, so Young Man Africa will be donating just a minimum of 10 books, which we could give 100 or more, but we'll give 10 books and a person will be us honest. So, okay, who's at the desk? Shall I start them to get the books? All the books. So much, young man, Africa. Hope you have a further review and uh, we should both participate. We accept this donation to our community. Our hope is that you have further review for people like that across your community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you very much. That's a round of applause for this. Thank you so much. I want to say a huge thank you to J Just Town Ambassadors. They made this happen and we're indebted to them greatly. A round of applause for Just Town Ambassadors. Okay. All right. Now we do the questions. If you have a question, please just raise your hand so we wouldn't have to. Okay, what, one, two persons? Three questions? We're not lazy, are we? Four? Four persons. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Ilya of VOA. West of, West of Nigeria, is it? What? West of America, he has a question. Any member of the panel can choose to answer. So, Ilya? You, you are talking about, um, should we try to break free from this environment? Right? My question is, should we try to encourage them to leave these shores? For the proverbial, the proverbial um, greener pastures. But we, every day we, we say the opportunities are here. Um, my mentor that I've not met, Suleiman, said, "Look, it's here. Everything is here. All you need to do is just think. Everybody is saying so, and everybody, you in particular, wants to break away. Yeah, and wants to have a presence on the global stage, like you rightly said. I was in a band last week and." Two men, two youths, right? We're talking about how we would have taken that opportunity to get out, right? That their kids would have had a guaranteed future and all whatnot. But then every day we, we keep saying for us, like we keep, we keep, well, we keep saying, the opportunity is here. See what we have. See we have cows. See we have land. See we have. So what, what do we need? My second question is. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. We only have. 
uh, about six minutes for both the questions and the responses. We may not be able to take the entire four questions. We'll just take one more question after this. Any response, please? Okay, what's, what's the greatest, what do we think is the greatest commodity we export from Africa right now? Okay, some people would say food, some would say um, it's human resources. It's your culture. You know, it's because we, we think about these things and we think about, oh, they're mining lead in Wase or they're taking our forests and all of that. Your greatest export as an African is your Africanness. It's Africanism. It's what is going out there. Okay, so let me answer that. Am I saying we should move to other climes? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. What I'm saying is play in other pl platforms. Don't keep it in here. So let me give you an example. A lot of these music artists are not Nigerians and have dual citizenship. I can almost bet you that David is a citizen of the US. Yes. Bank of you is not a citizen of this country. Do you know why they are here? They are here because the dollar they make there makes more sense here. So what have they learned to do? They have learned to make the economy of somewhere else work for them here. And it's why I keep saying that I am all for the love of Africa. But if Africa does not know how to position itself on the global scene, you've not done anything. Okay, you have Acha in just. The Mexican has quinoa. Quinoa is a green that is also low, whatever. Why is quinoa now an international green and your phone here is not? It's positioning. It's telling your story. It's thinking about the things that you have. When I walk barefoot here, because I like walking barefooted, people will tell me, oh, you're not behaving like whatever. Are you aware that right now there's a science that says that everybody should be earthed every day? That you should walk with your feet. Okay? What's happening? We, we back our children with, with wrappers, right? White people went and made pouches. Right now, everyone has realized that for the sake of your balance, you're better off with your baby here. So what's happening to us? It's that we have not been able to take the things that make us uniquely African that work for us. Our systems of family, our ability to take care of the elderly, the values that we were passed on from, you know, and we've not been able to contextualize them into the today stage. If you're able to do that, you would stay here and it would work. Why is Eastern meditation, which comes from Asia, working in the West? You guys, you, you guys are a, a chief practice. I was reading a book by Tim Ferriss. He interviewed about 200 of the most successful people in the US. I can tell you that 150 of those people were practicing Eastern religions. Is it because we really don't have what it takes to work here? It's not. Because we have it. We have climate. He has talked about how beautiful Mambina is. Why hasn't anybody gone to shoot a movie in Mambina? Why haven't there been books written by the people in Mambina setting it in their climate so much so that the white person that thinks about it wants to make a pilgrimage to Mambila? I, I, I hope I've answered this question. So I, I want us to think about the things that you have here. What makes you as an African the most beautiful creature God has ever made? Well, and how can you take it out? I am passionate and that is the kind of fire we want to stay on today. I believe we won't leave this program the same way we came in. So I'm so sorry about the question sign, but right now we'll just take one more performance. If you have questions, please write them down, submit them at the desk, or at the table them at the JTA inner house meeting. We'll find questions for them and we'll get across to every person that is seated here. Just fill in the attendance form, write down your questions and pass it on. A phone number or a name will do. So with that, I'm going to call a young man, Tony Young, for his performance. Work very hard, they told us. Work very hard so that you might earn a place amongst us. And yes, we worked very hard, but look at us now. We're monsters. But when these useless, big for nothing leaders of ours die, we cry, and they give us public holidays as if we mourn stars. Can't you see scars? An ordinary councillor in Tudum where that has more than six cars. And these fat, pot bellied senators and lecturers keep chasing our younger sisters. 
It is driving me crazy, so I might just get a gun soon. But if we all get guns, then we all might all be gone soon. I have heard tales of chaos and wars. Stories that touch even a dead man's soul, and I wonder. I wonder if death will come thereafter. I wonder if life comes before death, or we're living so we die. I wonder if peace comes before wars, or we're fighting wars so we live in peace. I wonder. As I listen to tales of whole families slain, and rumors of towns filled with blood stains, I wonder why humanity will strangle itself with its own hands and hang its children on the rope of hatred it is weaved with ethnicity and religion standing as hangmen. I have cried to the heavens. But it seems that our gods have been slain too. And now no one is left to listen to the cries of Mamun Malo, whose husband was battered in his family land, nor the pleas of Malam Lamido, whose cows were rustled at night, nor the cries of innocent travelers as they're killed on roads by angry mobs, I wonder. If this earth is a big stage for humans to entertain God and his angels, or do they feel the pain in our hearts too? I wonder. Because the earth has had enough of the poor man's blood these days, it regurgitates it even. My name is Ilyas Kasimu. I'm a journalist. Uh, okay, well this event, I think it's quite apt. It's quite suitable for the times we are in. Right, like Nigeria is going through a lot of interesting times. Um, all manners of stuff are happening across the country. Um, much of it is left to be desired. But then, like the panelists said, let's see those things as opportunities for us to innovate. We need to get we need to get inspired by the things that happen that happen around us. The events we come across every day. Now, I mean, it's not just okay for us to um, go back to our respective bedrooms and uh, go into the victimhood mood. I'm mean, getting to think, no, things are not going on well in this country, so nothing's going to happen. I mean, it's, we just don't have um, no right to be hopeless. Hi, I'm Emmanuel Oyiman Gilbert, uh, professionally known as Supreme. I am a visual artist, uh, founder and creative director at Black Bold Africa. Uh, for the event, well, I think it was, um, was mind-blowing and it has helped me to learn more in digital skills and this is something actually I've, I've been planning or intending to go into as a visual artist. And, uh, so I just found the knowledge and I am trying to dive into that. And so the event for me was productive in that way. And I could go into the digital world and then find platforms to sell my works. And uh, basically, that's it for me. It was mind blowing. My name is Nathan Tok Mafeng, and I'm a student. So uh, basically, this program actually is quite mind blowing. Have you ever walked into a mall, maybe to buy a pair of shoes, and then you end up buying a complete set of clothes? That's what just happened this morning to me. I walked in here with a different purpose, but I came and I found out that this program was hosting. So I was forced to join the program, to know what it was about. And then at the end of the day, my, my mind is blown already. If we can have more of these programs, at least, Nigeria, half of the problems I think will be gone by the, by the year maybe 2050. More than, almost all the problems will have been gone safe. So maybe keep it up. Just keep up the good work, bring in more youths, enlighten them in this way, and then we'll see where we can go from there. I'm Hilkop Agata. I'm a student of National Film Institute. And today's program has really changed my thinking and my ideology about the black people it teaches me to appreciate myself more, to appreciate the country, and to appreciate the land which I'm in right now. So as who I am right now, I need to work hard to see that this country is a better place, should invest more in the country, to make sure that our own generation will be better than what our parents have. Thank you. Uh, my name is Young Ran. Young, I'm a performance poet, a, a poet, a creative writer, content creator, and a veterinary medical student. Um, this, this event is an event that we really need to have more, you know, 
these conversations, we can't ever have enough of them because we need to start seeing legitimate changes, not just in conversations, but people actually putting these conversations into practice. And the only way we can do that is by consistently having these conversations. It drives people into doing more stuff. And also, the fact that there are young people showcasing their talents, they've been given the opportunity to showcase their talent. It's amazing, you know, having North Priest perform, having me perform, having Supreme perform, and all of these things. also gives platforms, you know, and it is not every day you see people, like the panelists that were here, and you perform before them. It's like very few occasions where you see these people sit down and listen to you, and so it is, it is a very, very good opportunity for the panelists to be able to listen to young people who are actually doing stuff, and for the young people to be able to voice out um, all that you have to the people on the panel. My name is North Chris Judah. I'm a performance poet, a teacher, a voiceover artist and more. Um, if we had more of this, I feel we wouldn't be in the place we are right now. I think we're losing the war psychologically. Uh, we need meetings like this more, more often than we don't. I think it's a necessity to get it from here first before we move out, try to get it out. I think if we can get it here, then we can get it anywhere. So my expectations, that they were met. It, it, was, it was hyping, man. I was hyped. I loved it. My name is Dakar Yangayuba. I'm an entrepreneur in different um, sectors, tech, agri, and quite a number of things that I do. The event is actually um, an eye-opener to, to African, African youth. Uh, it indicates that there's a lot that the African youth can actually do um, with the opportunity that is around around him and um, this involves a lot of um, collaboration and partnership uh, among stakeholders okay and then key actors in youth empowerment and youth and, and development so the the, the uh, it's it's it is a clarion call for african youth to actually uh, pick up a challenge to be able to take a stand and say we, we need to make a difference in our own time and our own generation. Um, I will urge the young people to be, to be focused, okay? To have um, goals and objectives in, in, their, in their existence, in everything that they do, okay? To be able to make a difference. Because um, our leaders, have not really, really done well, not very impressive, but they can actually make the difference. The youths should be able to look at the weaknesses of, 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 of our leaders and the times and be able to build up themselves to be strong for, their, for, their, for the nation and then for the for, for generation. So they can actually keep a legacy for those that will come behind them.